All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining another one of the Siemens Cinemaric webinars. Today, you're going to get a, an interesting um, view of not just Cinemaric, but the kind of whole uh, holistic CAD CAM process chain or workflow. So you're going to get to see other products within the Siemens portfolio um, that kind of start to talk to, you know, keeping your entire workflow under one umbrella under the Siemens umbrella. So we're going to, we're going to get a chance to get a nice demo of NX, talk about a little bit from the CAD side and some benefits there, uh, certainly the CAM side, and then how that nicely ties in to the cinema control. So for those of you that are new, my name is Chris Pollock. I'm the technical applications team manager. For those of you that already know me, you might notice that the title has changed a little bit. Um, so we do have a, uh, a new team we're putting together, focusing heavily on technology. Obviously, I've been doing a lot of that in the past, um, but we're going to kind of expand what we've been doing. So we're all very excited about that. So keep an eye uh, out for even more stuff than we're currently doing. Now, before we get into our main topic, certainly for those of you that are new, uh, I always like to give you some additional resources from the Siemens side. Um, this would be more specific to Cinemaric. Um, you want to check out our CNC for You website. It's the URL at the very top. That is kind of your landing page for all things um, end user centric. So if you're interested in hearing testimonials, finding out some new features or cycles we're coming out with, um, just want to kind of get an idea of some cool little jobs and programs. There's all kinds of stuff on the website. Check it out. Um, all of our webinars, like you're in today, are promoted um, from that site. And there's also direct links to the webinars from that site. So um, by all means, you can go with the second link down, or you can navigate to webinars from the main page that's all hosted on CNC for you. Now, we also do have a, a series of training classes we offer, uh, two formats. We offer online training. Um, they are instructor-led, so they're multi-day classes generally, you know, three hour kind of lecture scenarios. And then we let you guys uh, kind of go off on your day. We do give you a little homework assignment. Um, so it's a great way um, to start to deliver some of the, the, the lower level or entry level topics. Um, and then for sure, when we get into our more advanced topics, we have in-person uh, trainings that you would actually come to our technology facility. It's in Elk Grove Village, Illinois and you can come in and, and participate in those more advanced classes. And we are expanding the class portfolio. Um, quick little pop-up of some up and coming classes. Um, I guess I didn't, <laughs> I didn't update this slide since last we were going to run this event. Uh, so some of those have already passed, but um, we do have some of the uh, level one and level two classes coming up, as well as our five axis class coming up in July. So check out the website, go to your trainings tab, and if you have any questions and you're interested in it, uh, certainly reach out. All of our classes are completely complimentary. Okay, the other thing you wanna always check out is our YouTube channel, the Mr. CNC YouTube channel. So for those of you that might've already been on my morning event, I did a nice little YouTube live promoting the Emugi Thriller, which is a drill, thread mill, and chamfer tool all combined. Um, so on that channel, we do um, all sorts of different, you know, technologies that we feel that you guys can get some, uh, some have some interest in or get some benefits out of. Um, it's not all just Cinemaric centric, where these webinars typically are. Um, so even if you're not completely a Cinemaric user, come check out some of the YouTube lives. There's all kinds of stuff that could be applied to any control. Typically, always done better on our control. Figure that one out, but. Uh, <laughs> but certainly would apply to any control. Okay, so before we get any further, I would like to introduce Carson Huber. Hey, Carson, how you doing, buddy? Hey, Chris, how are you? Very good, thank you for joining. So Carson comes from us from the NX side of the world. So he's a, he's a colleague under the software side. Um, Carson's got quite a few years of experience working with NX. He worked for some top OEMs in the past. So he's a wealth of knowledge here. Um, thank you for coming, uh, for sure. We definitely want to give you some opportunities in the future to come back. Um, but with that, I am going to transition over to Carson's screen here. 
So Carson, you should be live and I'm here when you need me. All right, Chris, thank you. Uh, yeah, like Chris was saying, my name is Carson Huber. I'm with the NX Cam uh, development team I'm based here uh, in the USA. So kind of what I wanna go over today are some four main topics. So what's new in NX? Um, and when I say what's new, what's new in the latest release, which is uh, from December, 2022. Then we're gonna go into the NX Cam post hub, um, kind of define what is a post hub? What would we def uh, find inside of the post hub? And then go into our CAD Cam process chain or we'll, where we'll be spending most of our time today. And with that, we're gonna see the benefits of using NX CAD, NX Cam, um, and then going one step further, tying that in with the Cinemeric guys um, with their new Cinemeric one inside of NX. So like I said, today, we're gonna to find an example part, we're gonna step through it, and we're gonna see how you can leverage uh, the Siemens portfolio um, for your manufacturing process. So starting us off, what's new in the latest release of NX? <clears throat> so the first operation I wanna highlight um, that came out is something called turn milling. So you can see from the graphic, really what this operation is, is it makes milling cylindrical car parts much faster and much easier than they were in the past. Um, so the target machines I'd say for this is any mill turn machine, um, even a standard 5X machine, as well as a, a live tooling lathe, right? So it's a new operation subtype from the rotary milling template, if you're familiar with NX. Um, and it's used to rough out parts. So whether you're doing a crankshaft, um, something off-center like you see here, or even something on-center, it's a way to get toolpath uh, much easier, much faster uh, than in previous versions. So we're going to dive into all these new examples uh, later on in the presentation as well. Next operation I want to highlight here is something called face mill mid-pass. Um, so this provides us the capability to mill selected surfaces much easier. And when I say selected surfaces, um, the surfaces I'm talking about here are kind of these gearbox shapes, right? Maybe very thin walled. Um, they're used for mating surfaces for, for a gearbox, like I was saying. So what we've done is we've simplified creating this toolpath. So let's say you select one of these surfaces and you just want one pass on one Z level. That's what this is going to give you. And we have two pattern types. Um, we have this mid pass and a convex hull. So the mid pass will take uh, the center line or medial axis of a given face and create one tool path along it. And the convex hull pattern will take a given shape, right? So this face here, and we're gonna drive along the outside of it. So this is much easier and this is really a nice uh, a nice operation. And one thing I want to highlight too is that we have a new modern UI uh, or user experience along with these operations. So as you see updates to our two and a half axis uh, portfolio, you'll see they're much easier to use um, with a lot of on-screen graphics to help you create your toolpath. Uh, next up, which what came out in uh, December 2022 is a 3D adaptive roughing. So I'm going to call this the, the brand new replacement for our traditional or at this point legacy adaptive milling. Uh, so some of the highlights of this operation are it's a much faster generation time. So this operation's uh, multi-threaded. Uh, we're, we're using all of the threads or cores of our processors and the computers. Um, we have a much more dynamic holder collision checking. So uh, it's going to be more reliable, it's gonna be faster, um, overall improvements in this sector, as well as enhanced bottom up cutting. So as you can see on this part, you know, our first cut level is gonna be this bottom face here. Uh, and from there, we're gonna step up the part by a specified increment. What we've enhanced is the non-cutting motions from level to level. Uh, so reducing the time not in cut. Um, so overall, I'd say this is a highly effective, reliable, um, and a much higher performing tool path for the legacy adaptive milling. Now, if you still wanna use the legacy adaptive milling, that is still inside of the software as well. All right, next up, uh, that which came out in the latest release is, are, are the mid-pass patterns for guided curve. So something similar, like we talked about that face mill mid-pass, which use what we call a medial axis, 
we've taken that same thought process and applied it to the guided curve operations. So traditionally in guided curve, um, for those of you who aren't NX users, you'd specify a cut area like this face here, and then we'd specify maybe curves along the outside of our part to drive our tool path from. The benefit uh, of these two new pattern types is that you no longer need to specify those curves. So if I just select this face, for example, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna drive a medial axis or the center line of this face, and now we're gonna morph around this mid pass like you see here. So that's the first pattern type. Uh, the second is gonna be this offset around mid pass. So we have a similar face here, uh, but instead of selecting curves, we're gonna drive that medial axis and using the offset pattern, we can step off of our part and step back on making for a clean transition. So in summary, this toolpath, you know, it's, it's one of the more highly used operations. It just made it that much simpler to create toolpath from it. So that's really what I wanna cover from the toolpath side of what's new in NXCAM. Of course, there's more features that were released, um, but those are just regards to toolpath. So next up, I wanna talk about the NXCAM post sub. This is something that we launched um, maybe a year or two now. And what it is, is we've provided some, some solutions for the customers to, to download machine kits directly into their NX session. So starting off, let's define what a machine kit is, right? I'd say that this is a digital representation of your physical machine inside of the software, whichever software you have, right? Um, but in NX, we're calling it a machine kit. So we're going to take the 3D model um, of our machine on the shop floor, and we're going to we're going to we're going to build it with a kinematic chain, like you could see up at the top here. So you'll have your machine base, you know, your X slide, your Z slide, um, all of your axes, depending on what type of machine you have. And then we can also define our axis limits. You know, any acceleration or jerk information. Um, can also be stored here for future use. Now, what makes this a kit um, versus just a digital representation is we tie a post processor to this. So with your post processor tied to the machine kit, um, now we have something where we can use G-code simulation to drive this machine. So now we can verify within NXCAM, you know, all of my tool paths. So with monitoring my tool paths, I can also check for collisions of any of the specified axes here. So if my head were to collide with my table, I could flag that. Um, if my head were to collide with my in-process workpiece or stock model, I can also flag that. So there's a lot of benefits to using this G-code simulation um, and machine kits with inside of your NX session. So taking a step further here, this brings us to the post sub. So now uh, Siemens has created the initiative to supply this to the end user. So we're doing this through what's called the smart machine kit solutions. Uh, these are machine kits that are built by the Siemens uh, NX CAM team. So some of the benefits here is that from this website, you now only have one click to open up the machine kit um, and install it in your NX session. So this website can actually be launched within NX as well as through, you know, a browser like Chrome. So currently there's over a thousand kits on here. Um, and those kits could be from, you know, legacy post builder posts. Um, they could be from third parties such as our reseller network. Um, and they can also be from us. So we have 50 plus smart machine kits that we have built. And I think the number is actually 75 now. And we're constantly updating these, um, constantly taking feedback and improvements to them. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna check out uh, this website here. So this is the post hub. So what you'll see, we have 1200 machine kits on here of all different manufacturers, um, varying levels of complexity. But if we wanted to find the ones created by Siemens, I'd find the smart machine kit solutions, hit apply filter, and you're gonna see these are all machine kits built by Siemens, right? So they're from a plethora of controls, a plethora of manufacturers, um, and they're all available for use as long as you have the licensing for it, right? We even get into as much as robotics here. So this is a great resource um, for anybody using NXCAM. 
um, additional resources on here, you can find the support resources tab here. And here you can find best practices. You can find different layers for your post processors, like a probing layer for FANUC based controllers. Um, best practices, like I said. So here there's really, as we continue to grow this platform, you're gonna see um, a lot more things coming here, especially to the support resources. So now we're able to give you incremental updates, you know, maybe in between major releases that you can just plug into your NX session. So that's where you're gonna see a lot of growth here. So that's all I wanted to cover about PostHub. Um, later on in our CAD CAM process chain, we're actually going to pull a machine directly from PostHub uh, and put it into our NX session. So now let's talk about our CAD CAM process chain. So introducing the part that we're going to review today, it's, I'd say it's a relatively simple part um, with some opportunity for some five axis cutting. So the stock of this relatively cylindrical part will be uh, rectangular. So six inch by six inch by seven inch. And the machine we're gonna be cutting on is a five axis mill uh, with a Cinemeric One controller on it. So this is a demo machine uh, that the Siemens team has built. So a little bit about five axis machining as well. I'd say about 80 to 90% of the five axis market, it's really three plus two machining, right? As you can see in this part, um, there's a little bit of five axis on here, but mostly it's positional. And this is just reducing our setups from let's say five or six down to just one or two. So that's what we're gonna see here. And the first thing I wanna talk about, this is bridging the gap between CAD and CAM. So this is the first step of our setup. And I wanna highlight something called the wave geometry linker. So the wave geometry linker, um, what this does is we're able to backing up. So when you create a manufacturing file, usually you're going to have a part file, right? And you're going to add that part file as an assembly component. And that's going to reside in your, in your part as a link. So that part doesn't belong to your current uh, manufacturing file, but you're referencing it. So any changes that you make to that part will actually change the original body, right? So what if you want to bring that part into your manufacturing setup, make any changes that you need to, to manufacture the part, but not touch the original, you'd use something like this. So we create a copy body in a part and the associativity is kept. So another benefit is if I have, you know, a designer that's changing my part upstream um, and I wavelength my part as it trickles downstream through my manufacturing process, the model is going to automatically update inside of my session. And then any tool paths will also update as well. So let's dive into NX and kind of take a look at what this looks like. So as you see here, here's my Siemens Sydney Mill 500. Uh, this is the machine that we're going to be using today. So let's just hide that guy for now. Zoom on in. And you'll see I have my work holding. I'm going to hide that as well. And now I'm left with just my stock and my part. And these are actually assembly components. So I, I added the component here. And if I hide them, they're gone forever. So right now I'm in modeling and that's how I've constrained everything. Now, if I want to go to manufacturing, um, the benefit of using NX is that you have your CAD and your CAM in the same system. So all I have to hit is manufacturing. And now I've loaded my manufacturing module. If I come back up to my assembly navigator, you can see I have some tools in here as well that I'm gonna hide. My stock and my part body are still here. Now, if I wanted to link these like I was talking about and actually put them inside of my part navigator, which means it's native to this part and not any other parts, what I would do is go up to geometry here and hit wave geometry linker. And I'm gonna get a dialog box. So what I do is let's say I wanted to link this part body here. So I can click OK here and I get an alert. I've already linked this body. That's OK. I can link a body as many times as I want. And you can see I have my associativity checkboxed here. So that way, any changes that happen, it's going to trickle downstream. So clicking OK here, maybe you see that not a whole lot has happened. But if I actually hide, the original part body here, you can see I still have one. 
And now that's found inside of my part navigator, which means it's native to this file. And you can see is this body here. So if I wanted to do anything like delete faces, so let's say using my synchronous modeling, I'm deleting some faces here. Well, let's try to reselect some of these. So now I've deleted that face there. You know, I can delete this slot here, right? And these guys are gone from my linked body. But now if I go back to my assembly navigator and pull up my part body, you can see the faint outline, it's still there. So that's the benefit. So as I manufacture some parts, you know, maybe I want to contain my tool path in certain ways that's just hard to do. Um, you know, if I link this body maybe three times, four times, five times, however many times you want, you can really control how you produce parts, especially on five axis machines. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this guy. I don't need him. So for, for the sake of what I've done, I've linked my stock body. I've linked my fixture. I've linked the original, what I call the original part. And then there's also a part that I've modified. So this modified part, as you see, I've removed all my bosses, um, all the holes, anything like that. And I'm going to drive some of the manufacturing use using this part body. Okay, so that's how we link CAD to CAM. Now let's get into pure CAM. So starting off, I'm going to use an operation called rotary roughing. Um, you know, this is more of a rotary part, I'd say, right? I could do this on a mill turn um, or even a Y axis lathe, right? If I wanted to. So what is this operation? I'd say this is a quick and easy roughing um, of the material from rotary style parts. So here we're going to support flat end mills, ball mills, as well as bull nose. And there's a couple patterns. There's a spiral type, there's an offset pattern type, and it's going to automatically switch between the two based on the best conditions. So as you can see down here, we have some different types here. Um, and some other things, right? We support intermediate levels, um, some automatic level ranges, so that way there's a minimal input from the user. So after I switch this live, you'll see, once again, I'm gonna be using that modified part body because I don't really wanna enter any of those bosses you know, with this operation. I just wanna do my net shape really. And then I'm also gonna limit my machining range uh, axially and radially by selecting faces directly on the model. So you can see here inside the dialog, I can limit my ranges by just clicking on my part body. And that's how we contain our toolpath. Let's switch back to NX. I go to my manufacturing operation navigator now. And you can see I'm in the program order view. But first, let's look at our geometry view. Like I was saying, with that wavelength setup, I have one blank geometry here. And then I have a modified geometry and an original geometry. And with these being a parent child relationship here, you know, underneath each other, they share one blank. So when I'm switching between my link bodies, I'm also sharing the blank, which just further streamlines the process. All right, so here's our rotary roughing operation. Now, if I enter this dialog here, um, you can see the main things I wanna hit right away is go into my geometry tab. And if I did wanna limit my ranges, here's where I would do so. You know, I can select objects, limit the ranges axially as well as radially. And as I change these values, you can see I have some on-screen direction as to how big that range is gonna be, right? So if I just hit cancel there, let's display my IPW and let's watch this thing machine. So you can see it's a much more optimized toolpath for a part like this, where we're first targeting maybe the most outwardly uh, material and moving ourselves in. And something like this, it really shows, you know, how, how, why it's important, right? I have a square stock, but a round part. Um, if I'm attacking it from the direction I am, it could be hard to get toolpath with other operations. So I think we released this somewhere around 1953, I believe. So it's been around here for a few years now, but this is a great operation. So if you haven't used it yet, um, I suggest checking it out. You might want to want to mention 1953. 
uh, from the version, not the year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I'm like 1953. That's been around a little while. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, version 1953. You know, we've changed the naming schemes, but yeah, traditionally it's that's about two years ago now. So and you can see we have a helical pattern, and now there's this offset pattern here as well, which wraps around the part. It's a really cool operation. So next, let's go into that turn milling operation. That new operation from. Uh, this December release, last December release. So highlighting again, it's easy to program. So we're going to use that modified part body. And we're also going to limit the machining ranges somewhat similarly to what we just saw, right? Axially and radially. And one benefit here is that we can shift our contact point. So meaning that I'm not directly perpendicular to my cutting, you know, of the part, right? I'm shifted slightly off center line. Uh, that way I'm not directly on the center line of end mill where there's no surface footage, right? Let's switch into NX, watch this guy. So you can see here, this is what this tool path looks like. If I just verify it, it's simple and it just wraps around our cylindrical portions of the, of the part. So opening up the dialogue um, inside of our main, right? We can limit this axially and radially, something similar where I can just click on faces Oops, I can just click on faces here and same with the radial. You'll see where I'm going with this, right? So if I just hit cancel, you know, that's how we do this operation. It's new to 2212. So of course, be on the lookouts um, for updates in the next release in June, as well as uh, this next December. So 3D adaptive roughing, one of my favorite operations um, that we've come out with. And so I'd say that the, the overall theme of, of this operation is, is to just clear material faster. So it's easy to select the cut levels that you want to machine at. Um, and with our top off flat faces feature, meaning that we're going to find any face that's perpendicular to our tool axis um, and automatically machine it, uh, it, just makes, it just makes life easier, right? So we have two use cases here. I have this cone feature, which I'm going to do bottom up cutting. And I also have a slot, which we're going to go into later as well. So now if I close up our roughing, I'm going to go into this top cone feature. And now I have 3D adaptive roughing. And now if you look here, it's like, well, where's my tool path at? Well, what I've done is I'm using the other part geometry now. So all I have to do is just turn it off and turn this one on. And now I have the original geometry, right? So you can see inside of here, we're going to helix down to this bottom level, and then we're going to machine up from there. So inside of the dialog, uh, when you first open it up, you're going to see an automatic range type. That means it's going to search for anything that it can machine uh, that is collision free. Well, in this case, I don't really want to go on the outside of my part. I just want to stay inside of this cone side of here. So I'm going to select this top face and the bottom level distance. You know, maybe I want something down there and I can move my cursor where I want my bottom level to be at. So that's nice as well. And you're going to be able to see also I need to contain my tool path to just within this this cone. So I'd come to geometry and then use something called a trim boundary. So if I just specify this edge here and say trim everything outside of that edge, meaning it leaves a toolpath in the inside. Uh, that's how we contain our toolpath and not have it look all over the part. So if I just click generate here, uh, you're going to see that really compared to the legacy adaptive milling, we've increased the generation time. Um, you see it took maybe eight seconds to generate and we're analyzing multiple levels, multiple floors um, and, and connecting it all together. So really a great operation. Now, if we just verify that quickly, we're going to helical in. Let me just speed that up. And now we're going to be wrapping around the outside. You can see some of those non-cut motions are a little bit different. We're slowly stepping ourselves up now too. So easy way to clear material fast. 
So next, staying on the theme of this cone, I just want to highlight um, something called Area Mill. That's an operation that's been there for a long time. Um, but really all you have to do to, to semi-finish something like this is select that face and with inside of Area Mill, which is a three axis operation, by the way, we can differentiate between steep areas and non-steep areas. So the way that we, we kind of change our cut patterns between areas is through an angle. So let's say this cone's probably 60 degrees. I would call this steep. Anything less than 60 degrees, I'd consider non-steep and I can change my tool path between those two sections. Now, I'm gonna also bring in another tool that's been around uh, that you may or may not know about and it's called Tilt Tool Axis. So what I can do with Tilt Tool Axis, this is available in our five axis operations for auto tilting, but it's also available in the three axis operations if you're using a ball end mill. So I can really convert my three axis path to five axis and I can do that via manual tilting. So I could specify, let's say a point or a curve where I want my tool to point to, uh, tilt to. Or I can also do this on an automatic basis where we detect any collisions and then tilt our tool path from there. So switching to NX, let's watch that how we do that. So first I'm going to open up my area mill operation. You can see first what I need to do is go into geometry, specify my cut area, which is this blue area. So that's all I need to do to drive my tool path. And now containment. There's non-steep, which is what we talked about, anything less than a certain angle, steep, anything greater, or I could use both of them at the same time. So if my steep angle is 40 degrees, let's say, I want anything less than that to use one of these patterns and anything greater than that specified angle to use one of these patterns. So for this part, I know all I'm doing is a steep surface. So I wanna do something called Z level helical, which is just a helical motion in the Z axis, like it says. So if I generate this, you'll see I've turned off the collision checking for this operation uh, for a specific reason, right? So you'll see that my, my holder here is rather, or my tool is rather short and my holder is rather large in diameter. So as I step down, and if I have collision checking turned off, you can see I'm, I'm probably gonna hit my part. So one way to avoid this is to right click and go to tool path and tilt tool axis. And inside of this dialog, um, you know, there's a lot of functionality, right? I can limit how much I tilt, I can limit how much I rotate. Um, but here, all I wanna specify for now is what's the clearance between my part and the holder and shank that I want. And all I have to do is click okay. And you can see I now have my modified tool path and this modified tool path, I've actually changed my vectors to, to honor my three millimeter distance from the, from the holder and part. So this is gonna look at any collisions and change that. So that's something really powerful, especially if you're in the mold and die industry, right? You want your, you want to be able to machine everything in one shot, but you want to stay three axis as much as possible to reduce axis motion, which could lead to, you know, maybe gouging the part, whatever it is, right? So this is a great feature that maybe not a lot of people take hold of. All right, keep moving along here. We're moving from uh, semi-finishing to finishing. So the first topic I wanna bring up is barrel swarfing. So barrel swarfing seems to have been like the hot topic, especially in five axis uh, the past couple of years. So really what is a, a barrel tool, right? So it's these conical shaped tools as you see here um, and compared to a ball mill, Right, so this ball mill has a six millimeter radius. This barrel tool actually has a true radius of 80 millimeters. Um, but since it's tapered, uh, you know, and using this tool form, we're, we're allowed to finish surfaces much faster. So for example, if I were to finish this wall here with this six millimeter ball, and there was a specified scallop height or an RA um, on the print, right? My step down is gonna be very small to hit that. Well, if I have a barrel tool with a much larger radius, I can actually take a bigger step down 
and then that allows me to finish my part faster. So, you know, your cycle times could be reduced as much as 80%, right? Just for example, if you had a flat wall, for example, um, the more curves you have to it, you know, maybe your step downs change, but this is really going to be a big, big thing in the future. So what features are barrel tools best suited for? Like I said, large flat surfaces or, you know, slightly curved surfaces. And if you have areas with a lot of contouring, right, you know, there could be opportunities to use a barrel tool. So let's talk about how we do this in NX. Um, so right now we have two operations, variable contour or variable streamline, where you would select a cut area and a drive surface. And now we would just choose the SWARF drive uh, tool axis method to drive our tool path. And I just want to say that we do have a standalone operation coming for this soon. So be on the lookout for that and for any teaser videos. So now I'm going to go back to NX, close this down and open up my barrel swarfing uh, sub program I made here. So now you'll see if I want to finish these curved surfaces, you know, they are slightly curved. And if I wanted to finish that with a ball mill, my cycle times would be much larger than if I was using this tool. So opening up my variable contour, see first I want to specify my cut area. So here's the areas I've selected, this face here and this top smaller section. And now I need to make a drive surface, right? So because I have a split surface here, it's hard to, you can't make a drive surface from two surfaces, you need one. So if I click in the eyeball, you'll see I don't, it's not visible on my screen. So my drive surface isn't on this part. I've actually utilized that wavelength part or copied part body. And this is my drive surface. So because I deleted those channels, I get one smooth surface made from synchronous modeling. So this will actually give me, you know, the best, uh, the best tool axis. Okay. So I just hit cancel out of there. The only other thing left to do is go to my axis and avoidance node and change to Swarf Drive. So here we're gonna use the side of the end mill to drive our tool. So let's display our tool path again. And now you'll see, it's fairly simple to get tool path. That'll cut this. And now my step down is much larger than it would be with the ball mill. You know, depending on my speeds and feeds, step overs, you can greatly reduce the cycle time. Okay. So keeping on this theme, I want to talk about merge toolpath. Uh, this is maybe something else that most people don't look into if you're a user of NX Cam. If you're not a user of NX, um, this is going to be a pretty cool feature. So we're able to kind of optimize our non-cut motions for five axis toolpaths. And we can do this in a few ways, um, level by level or concatenation. And what does this mean, right? So merge toolpath is going to stitch together multiple operations. So if I had five, five axis operations, I can stitch those together and NX will see it as one operation. So using concatenation, if this is operation one here, I'm going to stitch the end of operation one to the start of operation two. And between that, I can control my NCMs. Here I have kind of a direct motion with some smoothing in it. You know, I could return to a clearance plane or return to a clearance cylinder whatever I want to do, right? So that's that's neat and all, but what's really cool is level by level. So when I go level by level, what I can do is stitch, let's say these four variable contour operations on the outside of this part together, and I can step them down, like I says, level by level. So I can go level one from operation one, level one from operation two, level one from operation three, and so on. And I can change how many levels. I can go two, I could go four uh, before switching. And where is that applicable? I'd say in thin wall components. So if you're on, let's say, some thin wall aerospace rib part, you can't finish the whole side of it because you're actually going to end up warping your part um, or having some bending forces, right, depending on your material. So if we, if we do a couple passes on one side, a couple passes on the other side, we're definitely going to mitigate that. So seeing how that looks like in an X, you see I have my multiple operations here, and then I have one merge tool path. And where would I find that? I'd go into create program up here, 
find my mill multi-axis template and that's where my merge path is for, for multi-axis operations. So if I open up this dialog, you can see I can do it by concatenation, which would just stitch the start of the end of one to the start of the next, or contour count, which is our level by level, I'll call it. And that's where we stitch these all together to create our toolpath. So let's just play this and see how this looks, right? So now we're going level by level through each operation, which this would be pretty hard to program if you were just shooting to do it in one operation. But we have the control using NX to do four different operations and really treat it as one. So this is a cool feature. Okay, so lastly, the last five axis operation I wanna to highlight today um, is the variable axis guided curve. So we kind of talked about that earlier, um, how we have some new tool path options or cut pattern options. Um, but I'm gonna bring up an option maybe you've used or maybe you haven't. It's called interpolate around axis. So this is a tool axis control option. So traditionally I'd say people mostly use normal to drive or relative to drive, right? That's the easiest. You select a cut surface. I wanna stay normal to that or I wanna give myself a slight tilt to that surface. Well, in a little bit more complex cases, you might need to use some of these other tool axis options. And this one, interpolate around axis, allows you to choose different tool vectors along your cut area and where you want your tool to be pointing. So as we do something like this undercut, I really have full control of how I'm gonna be wrapping around this part, right? So hopping through NX, let's find our variable axis guided curve. So you can see I have some sort of helical pattern to finish up the bottom of this guy. So if I go inside of my dialog here, you can see my guide curves. I have two guide curves and I'm gonna morph between them. So one's right here, the other one's up there, morph between them. And here's my cut area, is this whole rim I'll call it. And then I head over to axis and avoidance. And in here, I select my interpolate around axis option, click my wrench. And you'll see now, here are my different vectors on my part, which I've selected. And you can see also, because I have a machine kit loaded, I could see exactly uh, the axes of my machine and where they'll be pointing at that point in time, right? So if I click on this first one here, you'll see my A axis is gonna be at 90 degrees, right? And the last one here, it's gonna be at 20 degrees. That's another benefit of using our machine kits. So what does this look like when you simulate it? Let's just click our toolpath animation. So we're really gonna be wrapping around the part here. And it gives us just that advanced next level control that maybe just normal to the dry surface wouldn't, right? And if we were to rotate around, will be pretty much normal at the end of it. All right, so kind of finishing up with our multi-axis uh, talk here is multi-axis deburring. Um, so we've had multi-axis deburring now, but now what we're adding in is chamfer tool support. So traditionally, um, you know, multi-axis deburring was done with the ball mill, so you're truly deburring it. Right, but now with the chamfer tool support, you can also do multi-axis, I say chamfering, because you're putting a true chamfer on the part. Uh, and the way you control this is by specifying a contact height, and you can do this between, let's say zero and one, right? So zero would be the bottom of your flute, one being the top. So if you specified a 0.5 value, you're gonna be cutting at right in the center of this, as you can kind of see here. So this will be in our, um, all of our deburring operations, such as three axis, uh, three plus two axis, four axis, and five axis deburring. Popping this dialog open. What you see here, usually it's, you're gonna have uh, out of the box an automatic edge detection, meaning it'll find any sharp edge on the model and it will try to deburr it. If you don't wanna deburr every single sharp edge, you deselect that and now we can specify certain edges I wanna hit, as you can see here. 
So if I specify this edge here, and my contact height is 0.2, so I should be about 20% of my flute length this way, and my deburn depth is 0.2. So this is a really easy way to, to be uh, deburring on this part. So let's just simulate this guy. So as we wrap around the part, we're always gonna stay normal to our surface. And then I see a question, is the one in the millimeters or some other scaling? Um, I'd say I would treat that as a zero to 100%, right? So one would be all the way at the top, 0.5 would be 50% um, of your flute length. So maybe some, let's get into some ways to speed up our programming. So certainly if we have a prismatic part like this, you could be duplicating your programming process, right? So this channel here, um, as you saw on the part, uh, there was a channel exactly on the opposite side of the part. So how would I just copy that part, you know, or copy that toolpath and put it on the other side without reprogramming anything, right? Well, you could do this through mirroring or transforming the toolpath. So in any operation, you can right click and go into object and transform. And here you'll have three options within the transform. You can move your toolpath. So this would simply move the toolpath from one location to the next. You can copy the toolpath. So meaning it will duplicate it. Or you could instance your toolpath. And here I'm going to select instancing because this will actually link my second toolpath to the first one. So any changes I make to one, it'll make to all of them. So seeing I've done that actually in a few spots on this on this part here. So I have my 3D adaptive roughing here, right? Uh, you can see right away I get all instances of this will be edited to unlink. Um, you know, there's some preferences you can change. But what I've done is I've specified a top level and a bottom level. And then to contain it within just this little slot, I've also specified a trim boundary, right? Say, just stay inside of the slot. Um, this would be, you know, a little bit tedious to do exactly on the other side. So what I was able to do is go to right click, object, and uh, transform here. You could also use the mirror option, um, but there's a mirror option here. So let's mirror through a plane. I'm going to instance it, and my plane selection here, I could all sorts of plane selections, right? A distance from one, you can do a bisector. I could go through the center YZ plane, which is what I'll do here. And I'm gonna instance it. If I just click okay, you can see I have a new operation here and it's directly linked to this guy. So that's a nice feature and a way to speed up your programming on these parts that are symmetrical. All right, so that is the, I'd say the CAD CAM process chain. We haven't done any simulation yet. Um, we're gonna get into that next. Uh, but if you have any questions of this, of course, please put that in the chat. Uh, Chris can tend to them and we'll come back to them at the end. So moving into our last topic, verification. How are we gonna verify the tool path that we've created in CAM um, and make sure that it's good before we get out to the machine? So traditionally, or I'd say what we have right now in NXCAM is something called the Common Simulation Engine or CSE drivers. So what a CSE is, it's an emulated CNC controller. So all the common CNC controls we've built, um, such as Cinemeric, Fanuc, Heidenhain, um, Akuma, right, Maze Control, whoever it is, we've basically rebuilt how the controller functions inside of NX. So that way, when you verify it using G-code simulation, you're getting as close as possible to the real thing without having the real thing. So right now, the CSE engine, this is a great tool to have. Not everybody has G-code simulation. So already NX Cam, you know, we have a leg up, right? But really what happens is when you bring in, when you wanna to go to the next level, this is where you tie in uh, that holistic approach we're talking about, the CAD, uh, the CAD workflow to the CAM and the CAM to the CNC. 
So we're doing this using something called VNCK. And this is a virtual NC kernel. And this is you know exactly what the machine is. So Siemens has a software called uh, Run My Virtual Machine. And what it is is the original Cinemeric CNC software on your computer. So what you can expect is 100% the same behavior um, as the CNC in your shop floor, right? So you boot up the software, uh, you take it back up from the machine on your floor, you input it into the software, and now you have a one for one. Okay, so the use of all the Cinemeric CNC language, uh, all the original CNC variables and cycles, right? So let's talk about, like say G81, for example, right? That's FANUC. Um, but if we're using a CSE, what we do is we basically uh, reverse engineer it inside of NX. So we're emulating how the cycle works. Now, if we went to the Cinemeric or VNCK side, uh, since we're using the control to drive it, there is no emulation. We are using the control so that G81 is going to be exactly the same. So with that uh, CSE, you're going to get accurate calculation times, something really close. Uh, but the VNCK, you're going to get exact execution times. And so this is something that only Siemens offers, right, uh, with our complete workflow. So how do we do this in NX? Um, what we're going to do is we're going to pull a sample machine from PostHub. And the real application for this is going to be a one-for-one -one of the machine on your shop floor. So let's go back to NX now. And if we go to the machine tool, well, first, what I'll do is I'll say, let's turn on our machine again, right? So here's our machine. Um, I've pulled this from PostHub, and I'm going to turn on my, my fixture model, and then I'm going to turn on all my tool holder models so we can see them simulate as well. Okay, so now let's take the enclosure off. So this is what we're going to use to simulate, but how would I get this machine in the first place? I go to my machine tool view, and then all the way at the top, I double click here, and I can go retrieve a machine from my library, which would mean local to your computer, or I could go retrieve a machine from PostHub. So like I was saying earlier, we have direct access to the PostHub from inside of NX. Obviously, you need an internet connection. So if I just type in Sinumil, the name of our Siemens 5-axis machine, you can see here. If I click the information button, um, there'll be some general documentation when it was built, when was the update date, uh, what versions support this kit, right? Any units, um, as well as documentation, sample code, uh, and then who the author was of this. So what I would do is I would download the machine kit and then it's gonna prompt you to, to uh, install this into your session. I won't do that just for sake of being live here. So let's click OK, and now we've retrieved our machine. So if we first want to simulate, let's say, our rotary roughing operation, I can click on this and go to our simulation tab. Here's another benefit of the NX cam. Um, simulation, this resides within NX, so you don't have to do go to another software. Um, everything is live right here. And now if I click on toolpath-based simulation, uh, I'll back up. I have a few options here. There's toolpath-based simulation, uh, machine code-based, and then external program simulation. Uh, so let's say if I have everything defined correctly, I can actually simulate a posted code, not from NX, inside of NX, granted as long as I have provided the necessary information, such as any cycles or any custom macros, right? So the toolpath-based simulation, this just uses the internal CLS data or cutter location source data. Uh, and this doesn't have anything to do with the post processor. So any, you know, if I say I want to limit my axis to go from only zero to minus 120 degrees in the A-axis, we won't know that here. So if, let's say, let's just play this for a second. You can see I didn't do a tool change or anything, but I'm actually on the back side of this part. And that's because well, NX doesn't really know that I don't want to rotate that way. And the only way NX will know that is if I define that in the post processor, right? So it's not really what we want. So let's finish that simulation. Um, find it again. 
go back into here and we're going to choose a machine code based simulation. Um, and since I have a VNC cake kit loaded, um, the simulation is actually going to be driven off of my create my virtual machine. So just highlighting this quick, this is exactly a one for one um, of, a, of a Cinemark One controller, right? Granted, this is our example one, um, but what we're going to see here is as we drive this, they work in tandem together. All right, so let's hit cycle start in this guy. Slow her down a little bit. So now you can see because I'm using the posted code, um, I'm actually rotating my table the correct way. And you can see, I can see my machine statuses. Um, my, uh, my cycle time is gonna be correct because I'm actually using the controller to drive an X. So as I speed up my feed rate, you know, we're gonna go slightly faster to my program feed rate to see up there. Uh, so really this is the next step um, in verification, right? So this is how we complete our workflow. Now, if I want to say reset, the con now the controller is driving an X. And if I go into jog mode here, I can actually jog my axes around. And that's how I drive my controller, my machine. So I think that's pretty cool. I mean, this is, nobody else has this right now. And this is, this is the next step. So now if I hit finish simulation, maybe let's verify some other operations. Maybe let's watch this uh, multi-axis deburring simulate here. So when I hit simulate machine and I go into machine code based simulation, um, Gotta reset here. There we go. So something's happening here, but you guys get the gist of it here. This is uh, this is our complete solution. So now let's hop back to the PowerPoint. That is the conclusion of what I wanted to show today here. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, now, of course, we can take any questions. We can go back and review anything. Um, but of course, thank you, Chris, for hosting us today. And hopefully we can do this again in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you, Carson. Uh, great demo. Certainly you lived up to any of the expectations I had. Uh, so to Carson's point, and I know those of you that maybe aren't familiar with this interface because it's new for us too, um, there's the question um, basically at the very top of the right side of your screen, um, um, on top of the little bio, there's an ask a question kind of field there. So you guys can plug it in there and I should be able to start seeing questions. Um, there is the chat at the bottom, but it would be easier for me if you plugged it into the top. So we do have a couple of questions that already came in, Carson. So why don't we start? Um, so, so I think this was, yeah, this was when you were talking about the rotary roughing. So does the part need to be in the center of the rotary axis for rotary roughing? Uh, so no, in the rotary roughing dialog, uh, there's actually a selection where you can choose your axis of rotation. So you could choose the X, the Y, or the Z or as well as a constructed axis. So you do have opportunities for off-center work. Now, I, I would assume, and I'm gonna build off his question, um, from our control perspective, would it uh, just handle that by shifting the, the root G code? Um, so it would need to have been modeled how far it is off of the center of rotation, or do you think it has the ability of taking advantage of either cycle 800 or Traori? So I'd say that's depending how you're, obviously what controller you use, right? I mean, I think the Cinemeric has a benefit there. Um, something like Cycle 800 or even Transmit, right? Yep. Uh, so that's going to rely on your post processor and how you build it. So okay, NX cool. just creates the tool path somewhere in space uh, and the post processor is going to determine what that code looks like. Perfect. 
Um, all right, we got another one. Which toolpath, this came from Jack, which toolpath did you say would be good for thin walled machining like an, like an aerospace? Um, so actually I'll pop back to NX for this. Perfect. So when I was saying thin wall machining, right? Uh, really any, it just depends on your use case. But what I was highlighting here is, let's see, is the use of that merge tool path. So that's where I have a thin wall and I could use any of my, any of my multi-axis operations here, probably a finishing one like guided curve, right? Um, contour profile, you know, any of the finishing operations. And what I could do is then stitch them together where I go to create program. And then under the mill multi-axis template, there's the merge path. Okay. And that's where I can merge them together and control which, you know, if I have, let's say there's 10 levels here, that's where I can control. I want level one from toolpath one and then level one from toolpath two and then go to level two of toolpath one and so on. Right. So that's how you can control your step down um, and any bending of the part. Right. So we can kind of, we can keep the material move or removal really concentric, right? Yeah. So we're not removing a ton of material off of one side of the part and then jumping to the other side. Effectively, we're going to be able to kind of work it down. Yeah. And that's, and certainly right in this case, you could probably figure out a way to program this using only one operation doing what I said, but it's going to be a lot harder rather than just making it simple doing one, uh, one side and the other side and then dragging them under this merge path. Yeah, no, that is very cool. Extremely powerful. And it doesn't, I mean, I'm a, I'm a novice NX user, <laughs> I would say, but even I feel like I could, I could handle that. That doesn't look very, uh, very yeah. difficult yep. at all. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, oh, we were talking about the post hub a little bit. So can resellers place posts on the post hub or is it just for internal posts? <laughs> Yeah, so resellers can place posts in the post sub. Um, if I want to find that here and go to my home tab, um, usually where you'd see that is under this custom. So free is pretty much anything and everything that's free. If I go to custom and hit apply, here's where you'll see all of our resellers, you know, someone like Swoosh or Janice, uh, Silva Digital, right? And since, you know, a third party made them, not Siemens, you'll see this little dollar sign, meaning that contact them, see how much it's cost uh, to get integrated to your system. Now, so are, are this... users allowed to also post here if they want to give away their post or is it only for solution partners and us? So and I'd say, yeah, for solution partners at this time. All right, that makes sense. At least this way we can kind of ensure the, the quality of the product you're downloading. Yeah, yep, yep, correct. Um, oh, here we go. Um, with mid-pass face milling, um, Will collision avoidance be um, keep the tool from hitting any features on the part? Um, yes. So in the presentation, there was a gearbox, maybe with some webbing or walls from the casting. So if there are any collisions, of course, we're going to trim those out. Um, if I go to my face mill, uh, where is my top cone? Face mill mid pass here. So if I open this guy up, you'll see I specified my cut area and some of that new UI I was talking about where I can click and drag my operation um, and I can see my pattern offset depending where I want to touch or contact my tool. Um, but in an avoidance, right? Any avoidance, we're just going to degouge it. So you can see here, yeah. if I have a trim there, we're going to, we're going to avoid that. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly what they were asking. And, uh, and we have one final question, which I'll throw it out there anyway, even though I know the answer to it. Will VNCK work with my FANUC? VNCK kit will not work with your FANUC. <laughs> yes, this, this would require the Cinemark control. I would suggest trade her in and get a Cinemark. Probably be yep. the most sense. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good question. Though. Worth a try. <laughs> All right. Um, I think I got everybody. Let me just make sure nobody put anything. Oh, uh, there are a couple in the chat here. Is the uh, 1.0 in millimeters or some other scaling calc being used? Uh, yeah, so so yeah, that was that's based on I would say scaling calc of zero to 100%. So zero being zero, 100 being 
I pull up my my little end mill here. Where is that guy at? Terrify machine. Yeah, so if I click in this toolpath here, I have a contact type of 0 0.2. 0 would be right here. 1 as the maximum would be at the top of my flute. Um, so if I put in 0.2, I'm roughly 20%. Oh, so it's like a percentage, really, not... Yeah, it's really a percentage. Like you're 20% up the flute length. Yeah, ah, you're correct. I get that. Yeah, I could use a little bit more description there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how, uh, how to log in to Post Hub. Uh, so how to log in the post hub, obviously there's directly through NX. Um, there's also a link um, online. Like if you were to search NX cam post hub, you know, to Google or, or wherever you'd find it. Uh, you do need to have obviously uh, an account with, uh, you know, a Siemens account. Um, and then as well as a license for it. So I believe there are, you know, certain different licensing options you can get to access it. If you have the five access module, um, you should have complete access to post hub. Perfect. So I think I got everybody. Um, I will apologize if I missed anybody. Certainly some great questions. Um, post event, we will send out a link to the recording. I uh, just got to figure out how to do all that with this new software. So bear with us. But hopefully you guys got a lot out of this. Um, and if you, uh, if you if you like expanding our content and exploring more of these additional uh, Siemens, um, you know, so Siemens portfolio, please let me know. We'd love to bring Carson back, dig in a little bit more into the NX side, uh, as well as, you know, we'd be open to any other topics that you guys are interested in. Uh, so thanks again, everybody for joining us, Carson, thanks for taking time out of your exceptionally busy day and we will see everybody real soon. Have a great weekend. All right. Bye guys.